The industrial uses of phosphorus compounds have a notorious environmental history beyond mining and their use in, as fertilizer, but also inspired an early form of environmentalism. In everyday use, phosphorus is probably most familiar, at least to urban types like us, as the striking surface on match heads, where it has been used since the 1830s. The London Match Girl strike of 1888 helped bring public attention to the disfiguring occupational illness known as fossy jaw, caused by repeated exposure to white phosphorus that became concentrated in bones and teeth, particularly near the mouth where it was most likely to, to get into your, to their bodies. The resulting movement, though, and here's something we can give as a positive spin, eventually produced the 1906 Berne Convention, an early international environmental agreement that prohibited the use of white phosphorus on match heads, at least for the most part, which was replaced by, must, by much less volatile red phosphorus. During the 100 years of now, phosphorus compounds have also been weaponized, first as incendiary bombs during World War I, later as nerve gas in the wake of experiments by German insecticide researchers in the late 30s and 1940s. After the banning of persistent pesticides like DDT in the 1970s in many parts of the world, organophosphate pesticides, such as malathion, came into widespread use for control of mosquitoes, for agricultural pests, and even in household flea bombs, which I made the very bad mistake of using once to help protect my pets and myself. Although they break down quickly and do not bioaccumulate, organophosphate pesticides are far more immediately toxic to humans than these persistent pesticides that they replaced. Like their close relative sarin gas, they are potent neurotransmitter disruptors and have been strongly implicated in causing or initiating multiple chemical sensitivity, a debilitating environmental illness that makes sufferers sensitive to a wide range of otherwise benign substances that we encounter in our everyday life. Um, phosphate, which is actually a, a molecular form of phosphorus uh, combined with four oxygen atoms, is really going to be the focus of our comments here uh, most of this day. And I'll point out that it also has many industrial uses beyond fertilizer, um, perhaps most notoriously as a water softening agent that enhances detergent activity in hard water, but then washes into our waterways and wrecks havoc that we'll hear about from others. Um, phosphate's uses, industrial uses, have been negatively implicated in a wide range of um, environmental systems. But, here's the but. Nevertheless, it's highly deceptive to think of as phosphorus in, as inherently diabolical by nature, or bad by nature. The very reason that phosphorus compounds are so potentially dangerous um, when misused is because the element is so necessary to life. We've already heard quite a bit about it, how um, important it is to the basic uh, biological functioning of all organisms. One thing I'll add, though, and also to introduce the theme of the Anthropocene to this, is that these um, phosphate is so prominent in human, or in human urine and in all the other microscopic organic debris we're constantly sloughing off and that uh, gathers as dust in our homes, that uh, um, phosphorus is, um, and it's so lasting in the environment, it tends to stay where it is. It's an element, after all, phosph phosphorus is. That soil phosphate analysis has become one of the most important standard methods um, that archaeologists use for mapping ancient settlement sites. Phosphorus is a distinctive marker of our impact on the planet, going back to the beginning of settled life. Phosphate, in fact, is so indispensable that, as we've heard, its scarcity can place a fundamental limitation on organic growth within an ecosystem. John Bennett Laws and a scientist we've already heard from today, Justus von Liebig, have attained the status of demigods within the history of science, technology, and agriculture for their role in the initiation of research into the phosphorus cycle during the mid-19th century. This fertile period for techno-scientific innovation 
and its immediate aftermath is the main focus of the remainder of my comments. So, the argument. Widespread experimentation with, first with phosphate-rich bone, urine, excrement, and other more organic materials, both for agricultural and industrial purposes at the beginning of the 19th century, inspired an ever-expanding search for phosphate-rich substances for investigation and potential use and exploitation. Large-scale exploitation of marine bird excrement, a nice big bag full of it right here, or guano, to use the Quechua derived word for the substance that's part of our global vocabulary, um, became an important commodity of international trade between 1840 and 1880, and, and as a part of this played a pivotal role in generating transnational interest in new fertilizer, fertilizers. The widening search around the globe for sources of phosphate supply during the mid-second half of the 19th century and thereafter has been marked by a gradual transition from relatively limited supplies of recent biological origin, such as bones and guano, to much larger and far more ancient supplies of geological origin, such as coprolites and rock phosphate. My argument here, essentially, the argument of all of us, is that the creation of the phosphorus apparatus is as fundamental importance as anything in modern history. Not only because it has enabled spectacular increases in agricultural productivity that continue to support unprecedented numbers of people living in urban contexts around the globe, but also because this trend exemplifies a much broader transition in the fundamental ecology of industrial civilization, moving us from a reliance on potentially renewable sources of energy, building materials, and chemicals of many types to those derived from mineralogical or lithospheric sources. This has also involved the abandonment of ecological relations, fundamentally reliant on the biosphere and premised on recycling, and their replacement by those reliant on the lithosphere and premised on extractive mining, which have in turn produced ever-increasing amounts of throughput and waste. These lithospheric interventions allow us to take advantage in a um, productive way, a way that has made us wealthy as a species, of billions of years of Earth history. They are hallmarks, both in kind and scale, of the opening of a new geological epoch, the Anthropocene, when industrial societies have in, attained unprecedented influence as geological agents, and when human activities have emerged as the dominant force of environmental change on the planet. However, the geography and geopolitics of these geologic interventions remind us that the opening of the Anthropocene was also based not only on these substances and industrial production, but on the predatory colonization of distant environments and peoples. And its benefits have mainly accrued to a quite modest number of Northerners and European-derived Southerners. Meanwhile, and I'll show several photographs of this, the rotten, mined-out landscapes, filthy air and especially water, and grating social inequalities that have been unleashed by the wasteful quest of phosphorus have made abundantly clear our species' continuing lack of mastery over fundamental environmental and social problems. Now to this object, as you can see pictured here, and what I'll pass around. This bag of the genuine article, Peruvian guano, and mineralogical samples here have literally, literally encapsulate the historical processes that have brought us into this new epoch of geological time. As is so often the case, the violence of phosphate extraction is utterly erased from the consumer product it produces. If you look closely at the picture here on this uh, bag of guano that my parents bought at an organic gardening show in Tennessee for eight dollars U.S. dollars for one kilo, I gave it the best birthday present ever, at least for me. Um, 
shows an idyllic tropical landscape that bears no resemblance whatsoever to Peru's barren guano islands, much less to the millions of shrieking nesting birds that inhabit them. And by the way, that um, the use of guano in the 20th century in particular has done wonders in promoting the conservation of the birds that shit all this fertilizer onto these islands. Um, so it's not all negative. Even today, talking about the human involvement in this, guano is shoveled off these islands by poor migrant indigenous Peruvians, who though tend to consider it as of quite a good job. The fruit of their labors is primarily siphoned off for use by wealthy organic gardeners on the other side of the world today. People like my parents um, who shop at Worms Way. Um, if this guano remains in Peru, and actually most of it does, it is increasingly liable to be used for high value export crops grown organically, in particular quinoa. The trio of numbers on the label of this fertilizer in pretty much any bag of fertilizer you ever find 1002 for NPK betrays the intervention of professional scientists in the phosphorus apparatus, an almost indispensable um, intervention for what happened, who've guaranteed that this bag contains 10% nitrogen, 10% phosphoric acid, and 2% potassium salt by weight. These nutrients encased in the pellets inside, and if you'd like to take some home, you may. I'm going to pass this around. are ready to replace the nutrients extracted from your garden whenever you fail to return your own feces, urine, or bones back to the soil that gave you life. 200 years back when this story began, a good manure revealed its fertilizing value by its smell. The more putrid, the better. Take a big whiff. The most distinctive part of the odor is the smell of ammonia. It's going to wake you up. That's smelling salts after all. The same chemical also used as a household cleaner, which is responsible for another aspect of proving guano's value as a fertilizer. It's very high nitrogen content. Breathe deep, if you dare. Open that thing up and take a big squiff. Um, that's the putrid smell of how modern capitalist agribusiness came into being. The first stage of this process, and here, this is to let you see the global extent of this that developed in the 19th and the early 20th century, where most of these places are. The place where this all began is here off the coast of Peru. In November 1802, when German scientific explorer Alexander von Humboldt happened to pass several barges full of guano bound for Peruvian farms that smelled so rank of ammonia that he began to sneeze uncontrollably. Peruvian guano uh, after the reports that he brought back and the samples that he distributed among uh, uh, scientists of honor, so I'm honoring you by, by providing you guano today, became a subject of fascination among a class of wealthy, improving farmers living across a broad swath of Europe, North America, and plantation colonies around the world. People like Thomas Jefferson and George Washington, which here's a picture of Washington's reconstructed repository for dung, at, built by slaves at Mount Vernon in 1787. So guano was for the founding fathers in so many ways of modern society, intended that way. After Peru gained its independence from Spain and began opening its economy to the rest of the world, a market quickly developed for the first shipments of guano sent abroad during the early 19, 1840s. The, the industry quickly went global, first to islands, off of the southwest of Africa on this Pacific-centered map. Then to the Caribbean, and eventually to some of the remotest quarters of the Pacific Basin. Here are some of the places I'm going to focus on in, the, in, in my final comments here. So Peru, Nauru, former German colony, Banaba, the Kola Peninsula of Russia will be mentioned briefly, and some of the biggest deposits, and we'll hear more from Lino about these, are in Morocco, Tunisia, and Algeria. Let's not forget either, either other, close to home for me in the U.S. South, the Florida phosphate beds and Middle Tennessee. 
The Gibbs family, this is to show some of the social inequalities that come from this. The Gibbs family became spectacularly wealthy off the guano trade and built this splendid Victorian estate that displays only the smallest hint of the original source of its owner's wealth in a stained glass window next to the butler's pantry in the billiard room where the members of the family would get drunk and laugh about where all this came from. So you see <laughs> oops, the gold on these northern gannets. So they actually got the birds right here, at least in terms of their genus, that are great guano bearers. Contrast that to these kind of landscapes. Now, the proceeds from guano exports accomplished a lot of positive things. They paid for the abolition of slavery and the end of the indigenous head tax in Peru. But no matter on which islands guano was produced over the next several decades, the labor of guano mining tended to fall on poor migrant workers, typically from South China. If you look close, you can see the, cool, the typical coolie hats. The Pacific Islands are black convicts from the U.S. South who often live for years at a time in extreme isolation next to vast mounds of, of excrement. Despite the existence of millions of nesting birds on Guano Island suggesting the contrary, many continued to put stock in Humboldt's old speculation that Peru's guano deposits were an ancient geological formation somewhere to coal. In fact, we have one here, a phosphate nodule, that they looked at their black and brown surface and thought, Geologists thought that they were antediluvian dinosaur turds, full of phosphate. Guano mining was actually rather easy when compared to what was done here on the coast of England. Um, accessing these uh, phosphated, phosphatized nodules required the removal of up to six meters of marl overburden, and then huge quantities of water to wash the, the nodules off before they were sent to the superphosphate factory. Although, I want to point out that overturning the soil in this way, that they actually made a point to put the marl and the topsoil back and actually dramatically enrich the productivity of these fields in Suffolk and Cambridgeshire and other locations. Um, something that is not part of the history of phosphate in the other place. Here's more what we get. Here we see pictures of the systematic exploitation of Florida's vast deposits of hard rock and land pebble phosphate. This is a typical image of black laborers with a white overseer removing overburden by hand from a landscape of doomed longleaf pines, circa 1890. Following a common pattern in modern mining, modern mining, Florida companies eventually substituted heavy equipment for par labor and dramatically escalated the scale of landscape destruction. You'll see humans disappearing in these photographs gradually and machines and the rock itself become more important. Here we see steam-powered hydraulic jets, similar to those from the California Gold Rush, liquefying phosphate-bearing sediment, most of which ended up in permanent clay-choked settling pools or in these big mounds of overburden. This is an example of the kind of landscapes left behind by, phosphate, by Florida phosphate mining. And in many locales, these tailings and pools are dangerously impregnated with radioactive radon gas brought close to the surface by the industry. The history of phosphate rock extraction is also tightly associated with overseas colonialism, geopolitical rivalry, and war. Fertilizer reserves have been fought over just as keenly as the petroleum reserves of the Middle East. And uh, Japan, Australia, and New Zealand gained administrative control over a number of phosphate islands in the Western Pacific after Germany's defeat in World War I, including the biggest of them all, Nauru. And here's an image of some of the destruction caused by a German raider during World War II that made sure that it went to ret return to that former uh, slight. But this hardly compares to the environmental destruction that's been already accomplished on this island to make way for wheat fields or to produce the phosphate that would then be used to enrich the wheat fields and sheep pastures of Australia and New Zealand. To get a little bit closer, as you can see, it's leaving nothing but hard wasteland, coral pinnacles that you can't even walk across this landscape, much less make use of it. The human individual is actually difficult to locate within the immensity of these workings. And then to the end, 
Let's point out that this is also a major part of colonialism by France and North Africa. And let's not forget the importance of this in the Soviet Union, where the conquest of the Arctic had the search for phosphate resources as part of it, also involving the collectivization of Sami reindeer herders on the Kola Peninsula, bringing it into their traditional livelihoods. I'm going to wrap up and we'll look at some numbers. These projects have continued to grow spectacularly, albeit you can see with some minor hiccups, during the hundred years of now. But I want to conclude with a stern warning about fixating on the present or the now. These so-called, whoops, excuse me, hockey stick curves or J curves have become a standard fixture in environmental discourse. And the Anthropocene Working Group, which we've heard about, is scheduled to produce a recommendation soon about whether geologists should declare the Anthropocene as an official epoch of geological history. They've become especially obsessed with this great acceleration after World War II, from about 1950 up to the present, for so many different things. What's going, down on this boring, what's going on down here on this boring tail of this graph? The curve looks the same. You find that the global emergence of the modern phosphorus apparatus actually had its first and greatest acceleration, 100 times, 10 times increases here, during the six decades leading up to 1913. And I could draw similar diagrams for nitrogen fertilizer, explosives, coal and iron production, rail and steamship transport, population of large cities. It goes on and on. By these critical measures, the Anthropocene was already well underway before we arrive in the hundred years of now. Premised on the switchover from, here we have guano, here we have rock phosphate, moving from biospherically derived resources to lithospherically derived resources. And I propose that industrial civilization's unprecedented exploitation of the lithosphere since circa 1830 should become our primary marker for the onset of the Anthropocene. Thank you. Thank you.